Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's lecture <clears throat> on early Latina histories, where we are starting with uh, the first chapter in the Vicky Ruiz book, but I will also be adding some um, additional supplemental information, um, including uh, start, starting here with Doña Gertrudez Barceló, who was known as La Tules. The reading uh, talks about the early Spanish colonial period um, when the Southwest was still under Spanish colonial rule. And Latules is one of those figures uh, known particularly from the New Mexico area um, who moved to New Mexico shortly after the Mexican independence with her family. Um, she married at the age of 23, which was unusual in that time period when women were married at a much younger age. When she married, she kept her dowry, her own property, and her maiden name. She opened an illegal gambling hall catering to the soldiers and traders of the area. Uh, she was known for being an astute car dealer and businesswoman. She owned several businesses. She took care of her family financially, um, her extended family financially. Uh, but from the perspective of uh, European settlers and European travelers um, at that time period, she was perceived as, quote, the Mexican queen of sin and was often slandered in American publications. She was considered a woman of ill repute by Anglo-Americans settling in the area. Many of the de negative depictions of her were written to explain why the United States had invaded Mexico and that Doña Barceló represented the immoral nature of the Mexican population. So she was often used as an example as to why the, uh, Mexico needed to be um, invaded at the time by the United States. But she's an interesting figure, particularly from the perspective of the history of women during this time period, because she was so unusual. She did not fit sort of the domestic expected kind of roles um, of women at that time period. She was a businesswoman. She was very independent. Um, she spent her days basically catering to um, the leisure of the men in the area. And for that, she was often uh, perceived in a negative light. The reading also talked about Spanish colonial women and their relationships with native women in uh, the Southwest during that time period. On the one hand, there were um, compadrasco or comadrasco relationships with native women where sometimes um, colonial Spanish women would um, uh, uh, become godmothers to their children. But there was also, of course, a racial and class um, power dynamic at the time where, maybe, where many native women served as domestics to Spanish women as well. Spanish women also had more rights under Spanish rule before, uh, uh, under Spanish and Mexican rule before this area became part of the United States. They had rights to land ownership even after marriage, but they lost this prestige after the US takeover of the Southwest and were often depicted as flashy, morally deficient sirens. So this idea, these um, images that we saw being talked about by Doña Barceló were um, images that were also used um, later on against um, Spanish and Mexican women in the Southwest as it became part of the United States. One of the other women then to the reading talks about are the soldaderas, which were women who participated during the Mexican Revolution and were also sort of breaking the expected roles, um, the expected gender roles of women during that time period. These women followed the men, they followed the, the soldiers <clears throat> at that time and not only provided um, food and sort of domestic type of um, support for the soldiers, but they often, as you can see in this image, um, also uh, participated in fighting in the revolution as well. The reading also mentioned the baths that would be imposed on Mexican immigrants when they were crossing the border during this early time period. Um, what the reading didn't talk about was Carmelita Torres, who was a teenage girl who in 1917 refused to undergo the disinfectant uh, baths that were imposed on the immigrants as they crossed the border. 
Um, she ended up inspiring 200 women to join her protest and block the entrance through the border bridge in El Paso. They also laid in front of trains and vehicles. Eventually, she was arrested, and after that, very little is known about her history. I did include a couple of videos about her that have been made since then. But what you can see in this image is how she was described as this auburn-haired Amazon at the Santa Fe Street Bridge, Lee's feminine outbreak. So you see, again, how women are portrayed and talked about um, in the media during this time period. The really, reading really focused on sort of the uh, migration experiences of women during this time period. You know, what was it like for them when they crossed the border, um, particularly in this early time period between 1900 and 1920, where there was a large influx of uh, immigrants from Mexico, many of them who were fleeing the violence of the revolution. Um, but what we see here is what this crossing is like from the specific perspective of women. So for instance, often migration is talked about in terms of economics or um, political violence. But when you look at the perspective of women, you see that there are other reasons why women choose to migrate, one of them being domestic abuse. And we saw in the reading an example of that. They also talk about in the reading of las solas or single women or single mothers um, and how their experience was different when crossing the border um, <clears throat> and how they were treated and often assumed that they would become what was known as quote unquote, a public charge. And this a term was used throughout this time period for a lot of different um, immigrants. We see this also when talking about um, Asian immigrant women as well. So any woman that was traveling by herself was traveling with children, there was no man present. Um, the assumption was that these women were gonna become public charges, that they were gonna become um, dependent on um, government help because there wasn't a man with them to provide financially. <clears throat> but you can also see that many of these women held on to their agency and independence when crossing the border and when, and when uh, questioned um, about their intentions and why they were crossing the border, why they weren't with men. We saw the example of the woman who is questioned about what she's hiding under her rebozo, for example, and, and she um, demonstrates to the uh, uh, border agent that she is pregnant. Um, and so again, sort of this like suspicion from the border agents about these women and how why she's covering herself, she obviously must be hiding something. And what she's hiding is the fact that she's pregnant. Um, you also see the example of the brother and sister where the woman was more abrupt and aggressive towards her questioning than her brother was who was more accommodating to the border agent. The reading also talked about the role of family relationships and the complexities of extended family relationships. Now we often assume and talk about uh, Latinos as a population as being family oriented. And here she, the author really complicates that assumption, demonstrating the ways that often these women had to, because they had no other choice, to depend on extended family once they arrived here, but some of the hardships that they had to go through and how um, sometimes they weren't treated very well uh, by their own extended uh, family. And uh, she also talks about how um, many of these women who weren't often able to rely on their extended family relationships, again, that uh, relationship of comadrasco, women uh, supporting each other, women um, using their own uh, uh, relationships as a network uh, was a way for uh, women to be able to navigate the difficulties of uh, coming across the border and finding work and settling and so on. Many of the women also relied on each other for uh, curanderas or healers or as midwives because there was no hospital, there was no um, medical assistance where in the areas in which they were arriving and settling. And so the author raises this quote, we must move beyond a celebration of La Familia to address questions of power and patriarchy, the gender politics of work and family. And so the other really wants to sort of complicate the, these assumptions that because they come to stay with family that these relationships are necessarily going to be um, good ones. <clears throat> 
The reading also talked a lot about the various labor contributions of women during this time period and the different types of work that women um, did. So we saw women often uh, taking on different types of work, including domestic work, farm work, working in the railroads. Um, she also demonstrates the kinds of experiences that some of these women have in doing this kind of labor. For example, she gave a couple of examples of how some of the domestic workers were treated by the white women that they worked for. Um, for example, there was a woman who, the employer who <clears throat> gave her domestic funds to be able to bury her baby when it died. But then the woman, this wasn't a gift. And this was uh, something that the domestic worker then had to pay off uh, with her work after the fact. Um, <clears throat> they also talked about uh, working in the boxcars uh, for those that were working, uh, whose spouses were working in the railroads. Um, <clears throat> women and children often created their own gardens to supplement their food and income earned by their husbands working on the railroads, but women also took in borders, sewing and laundry to supplement their income. There were also examples of women doing additional informal kind of work, such as going door to door, selling pan dulce and other kinds of food that they made. Um, and then in other cases, you also saw the examples of women exchanging uh, sex for food um, in El Paso, Texas. <clears throat> the reading also talk about, talked about how these women didn't all, only work um, outside the home or to generate income, but also had the double day experience where these women could, would come home after being in the field all day or after working all day um, in their various types of labor and then had to come home to take care of their husbands, take care of the household, take care of the children. So the reading talks a lot about this double day that women had to um, experience as well. They also talked about um, the difficulties of balancing work and motherhood. There is no child care. So they have uh, many of these women, particularly those working in the fields, um, had to bring their uh, young children with them to the fields. And we see examples of how difficult this was for uh, many of these women. <clears throat> now the reading ends with what starts happening or the shift that happens uh, as the Great Depression kicks in in the, in the early 1930s, where essentially Mexican immigrants become the scapegoats, right? We see that early anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric kicking in. Uh, we see um, the kinds of things that are being said in newspapers about uh, Mexicans and particularly, uh, in particular women were portrayed as being prone to adultery. And they talked about also the high birth rates among uh, Mexicans that was perceived as a threat to um, the white uh, racial culture. Um, and we saw in the reading how Mexicans were talked about as sort of a lower quote unquote stock um, of a race and how their potential mixing with the American white race was a threat. And so all of this sort of spun right the country into um, a whirlwind where the solution became to repatriate Mexican Americans. And so you, there's a long history of this time period of Mexican Americans being either forced to or choosing voluntarily to leave before they got picked up um, and forced to leave. But the uh, issue with these repatriations uh, was that 60% of those folks who were forced to leave and go to Mexico were children who were American citizens. Um, and so this results in a large number of the Mexican American population being uh, uh, forced to go to New Mexico, uh, I mean to Mexico, sorry about that. Um, and um, has an impact then on uh, these communities, both here in the United States and in Mexico, as now a large number of people are returning um, to Mexico and the Mexican government now has to figure out what to do with these thousands and thousands of people. Well, in the meantime, this um, is creating a sense of uh, fear and panic among Mexican-American communities throughout the United States, 
who do not want to leave and um, are fearful of being picked up by the equivalent of uh, I, I ICE at that time. Um, and so you see in the reading examples of, um, for instance, some women who did not want to leave, um, but would then not um, turn to the uh, relief agencies that were available at this time during the Great Depression to provide um, uh, economic support to poor people because they were afraid that they were going to be picked up and um, returned to, to Mexico. So this here ends our lecture for this week. I look forward to your thoughts uh, in the discussion posts. Have a wonderful week.